I think nobody could play this role better of introducing us to the practice uh, of this new museology. Teresa Morales is um, uh, leading the National Union of Com Community Museums in Mexico. She um, is also setting up network after network, including the Union of Community Museums in Oaxaca in Mexico. That is where most of your day-to-day -day practice lies, I believe. And um, Teresa, I would love you to introduce us into this um, field of, of new museology, into the cultural heritage, the sharing of knowledge. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I also want to thank the invitation and the possibility of being here today with the, all the people that are doing this hard work of organizing the event. Um, I'm not used to interacting with so many in media, so I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, uh, as uh, Chris has suggested, I'm going to introduce very quickly a few remarks about the framework of museums and heritage some issues that have developed over the years. Uh, many of you probably know that in uh, 1962, there was a very famous round table discussion and uh, uh, agreement signed by people who had uh, been in an ICOM meeting in Santiago de Chile. And uh, there they started to talk about the museum as a new, uh, an, the need for a new kind of museum, an integrated museum that would respond to the needs of society, be more active in using heritage to fulfill different needs and that was a certain starting point that was developed uh, later on in the 80s, 1984, 1985, by the international movement of new museology. <clears throat> and uh, there they developed these ideas and uh, started to talk about a new paradigm that instead of uh, the collection of objects, the building, and the experts, you would have uh, a territory, uh, uh, you would have cultural heritage, and a community. So this was uh, what they started to develop more. And of course, over the years, uh, I think perhaps more, these ideas circulated more in Latin countries, perhaps in, uh, in France, in the uh, French Canada, in Portugal, in Mexico. But in the um, 1980s, there is uh, much more debate. And I think this quote of Rich and Kieran is from the 1990s. Uh, having to deal with how museums need to sustain more dialogue with uh, different communities, the, the need to have shared curatorship, to have participation in the way culture is represented by the peoples who practice those cultures and by local communities. And we have a very important convention in 2003 by UNESCO claiming the need to preserve intangible heritage and defining intangible heritage. But if we look at this series of agreements and events as, uh, as a sequence, it would seem as if there was just uh, a certain progression and that there aren't conflicts in this process. But of course, that would be false because the dealing with cultural heritage, the handling of uh, cultural patrimony is a conflictive situation, is one in which there are very many claims and uh, what's moved it forward, I think, is uh, the claims of different groups and different peoples, different cultures, uh, wanting to be more heard and their right to have their own heritage, their material heritage, their right to interpret that heritage is being more and more clearly uh, articulated. And these would be claims not from the top of the high, these high cultural institutions, but from the bottom up. <clears throat> The experience that I've participated in more directly is precisely a very grassroots, a very bottom-up initiative that uh, started in uh, Mexico. And uh, particularly, uh, my husband, Guatemala Camarena, and myself started collaborating with some communities at the beginning of this experience. It was started in 1985, 25 years ago. And... It really began because some of the indigenous villages in the state of Oaxaca began to propose that they wanted to create community museums. They are on the screen behind you right now. Okay. <laughs> so this is Oaxaca. And uh, I'll say very briefly that Oaxaca is a state in the south of Mexico. It has uh, the greatest diversity of ethnic groups within 
Mexico is a country, 15 different ethnic groups, different cultures, a great deal of uh, local identity, which is very strong, local communities. There are 570 municipalities within the state and uh, communities that are very active in claiming their rights in many different ways. <clears throat> yeah. And one of these communities had an archeological discovery in 1985, and they asked for support to create a museum because they wanted those artifacts to be kept in their community. They wanted this to be something that their children could see, that they could talk about, that they could interpret and have in their own village. And so we began to collaborate with them. And uh, this led to a process where we, we learned a great deal. We were able to open this museum in 1986. And then other villages started to uh, also ask for this kind of support. And we could see through the years that uh, the needs were emerging, that were similar, some uh, were, were different. Uh, a series, multiple different demands and claims. For example, some communities were very interested in uh, preserving the historical, historical record of land tenure. And this has to do with uh, recovering the documents that have to do with these rights that give them uh, a certain right to use this territory. So that was very important to them. That was one issue. The issue of archaeological heritage in this particular area is very strong. Mm -hmm. People feel that those are artifacts that should not be taken away, as they have been in the past, to national museums or, or regional museums. And then they lose that connection with that heritage. Uh, another issue, of course, is people in these villages often want uh, visitors to come. They want a venue into which they can uh, market their mm -hmm. production and their, their crafts. And more and more people are very concerned with how many of their traditions are being weakened mm -hmm. for many different reasons. Among them, the migration that is more and more mm -hmm. prevalent in all this area. So it was a, multiple reasons why people wanted to have these institutions. <clears throat> so throughout the years, uh, these communities uh, were more and more, and we started to bring them together in 1988. And uh, I should say very quickly that one of the parts of this process is that every one of these communities has gone to their village assembly, to their community assembly, to have this project approved as something that's interesting to the majority of the people in their, in their village. And these community assemblies have elected a committee to lead this process. Mm -hmm. So we brought these different committees together. <clears throat> First there were three of them, then there were seven, and then there were 10 and so on. And uh, they decided to form an organization, a non-governmental organization called the Union of Community Museums of Oaxaca in 1991. And that uh, network grew. It has established a training center to serve the group of communities and a program for community tourism as well. And throughout the years, <clears throat> uh, this organization in Oaxaca spearheaded the formation of a larger network in Mexico, mm -hmm. which is the National mm -hmm. Union of Community Museums, that brings together around 60 different community museums in eight states in Mexico. And so this organization is also moving ahead. And uh, to say just very quickly, in the year 2000, we started to bring together communities that are interested in this area from different countries in Latin America. And, uh, and now there are 12 different countries or participants from 12 countries that are uh, participating in this network of community museums of America. And we've had six international meetings and four workshops for facilitators of community museums of America. And to uh, finish up this first uh, intervention, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say very quickly two points that we think are very essential in this process which is that uh, if we were going to talk about uh, museums as a vehicle for people to have a greater uh, ability to handle their own cultural heritage, we have to talk about community appropriation. And that means communities being able to decide about how this is handled. It's not only about participating in a certain part of the process of doing part of the uh, installation of an exhibition or doing part of a drawing that's going to be in the exhibition, <clears throat> it means deciding about the whole process. So uh, we think this should be taken into account, that the museum should be a project that the community decides on in its uh, way in which it's able to come to consensus, which is of course very different in different communities, um, that it should be uh, a community 
a group of community representatives that leads the initiative, not someone from the outside, but people from the community <clears throat> that are, have a representation that are uh, legitimate representatives of their community that take this forward, that plan for it, they're the ones that handle the funds to do the project and so on. That the community be able to decide what themes they want to see represented in mm. the museum. Of course, this can be done in many different ways, in consultations, and neighborhood meetings. <clears throat> uh, it can even be done perhaps with a, sometimes with a questionnaire, but the point is for people to have their opinion heard what do they want to preserve? What do they want to talk about? What's, what are the issues that they feel are more mm. essential to have in the museum? Uh, instead of, for example, me going and saying as an anthropologist, I think this is the most important part of your culture for them to reflect on what, what, is, what is important to them. And uh, for the building to be decided on by the community. And then in the process of creating the museum that the people of the community participate in the research and have training to be able to do this research and have a workshop where they can design how their exhibition is going to be put together and participate in the whole process. So that uh, our role as experts or professionals in this field becomes more and more the role of a facilitator that offers knowledge, that offers training, that offers guidance, but isn't the one who's controlling the process or making the decisions. Okay. Just giving. Uh, tools, giving uh, possibilities, opening up different areas where people can act collectively uh, uh, around their own heritage and really be the ones that are owning the project and that are appropriating this, this tool as the museum. Teresa, thank you. And it's, it's actually great to, to hear you tell the story while the proof is being shown behind you, <laughs> picture after picture. Um, just a few questions, because it's obviously a, a huge uh, practice um, which we can impossibly cover in just, just this short time, but a few questions that strike me. First, now in your first presentation, you, you didn't focus explicitly on, on either tangible or non-tangible cultural heritage. In the pictures we see, I think both are represented. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the non-tangible, the ways how a community museum, in this case in Oaxaca, can preserve and present that, that non-tangible cultural heritage? Yes, that's, that's, that's a good question. Well, you know, when we open up the discussion in, in the communities about what they want to talk about, uh, very often it's clear to us that they don't usually recognize much of a division between tangible mm -hmm. and intangible mm -hmm. heritage, yeah. and that's probably something that we as, as uh, experts or, uh, or people who have studied the, in mm -hmm. the field feel that this, this division, and people in the villages usually don't feel that that's mm. much of an issue, but <clears throat> they'll talk about what's important to them to, of, of their practices, their customs, uh, and, uh, and so you know, they start to talk about what they think is most important to identify them and to, and to project and to represent, and they've chosen many different things that, um, for example, you know, the way people heal in the village, which is, of course, a part of an intangible Mm -hmm. uh, heritage, mm -hmm. the way uh, this this is carried out, the way they organize to have the fiesta, mm -hmm. uh, the fiesta for the patron saint. Uh, they've chosen themes like the way they've struggled to preserve their land mm -hmm. rights. Um, and there's, for example, one town that shows how how they celebrate their traditional wedding, which yeah. is you know something that was very important to them because they felt it really spoke about who they were as a community. So maybe maybe it's it's. A too obvious a question, but many of these um, um, traditions and heritage are actually uh, under threat to, uh, how do you say, disappear. Yeah? Mm -hmm. no, that's that is true. one of the driving forces probably behind this whole movement. No, that's very true. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think people are mobilized uh, to claim ownership of this heritage precisely because they feel that if they don't do this, they, they, it's, uh, it's possible that they could lose it. Uh, Either Lose it why and how? Well, because uh, more and more values are changing. Young people are having more doubts about how important this is. Mm. Uh, people have migrated and come back with a series of different criteria. Uh, and, uh, well, economically, a lot of the villages in, that I'm mm -hmm. speaking about have mm. trouble surviving <laughs> because of uh, uh, the, the productive base of their economy yep. is, is, is being weakened. Yep. So uh, a lot of these, these customs are, for example, one of the community museums, actually the first one that was opened, the first project at the 
committee, museum committee decided to develop was to develop, well, to uh, revitalize a traditional dance that hadn't been danced mm -hmm. for 10 years mm -hmm. because the, the costumes are very expensive. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is just an example of what you're saying. Yeah. The things are being uh, lost. But if there's an organized effort to recover them, they can be recovered. Now, a very obvious question. You're working on this day and night. Uh, if I wake you up at four o'clock at night and I ask you, Teresa, tell me now in, in, in two lines, why is this so vital? Why cannot we move on into a new century and create new traditions and uh, let the old ones become history. <laughs> I guess I would say that uh, to know who you are, you have to know what happened before. Right. And you have to build on your memory. Memory is part of who you are. If you, yeah. if you, if you wake up and then you're, you have amnesia, hmm. then you don't know what to do because right. what happened before. Okay. So <clears throat> we need our memory to know who we are. We need our, our memory to know our identity and what we want to do yeah. in the future. Very good. Okay, that that relieves me now. Uh, the other thing is kind of kind of undercurrent in 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 the short story you gave us is is this question of power, ownership, and especially in the region where you work, where where land ownership and and the ownership of of objects is such a <coughs> such an issue. Um, You've told us now quite briefly how you create <coughs> sorry <coughs> how you create communities, how you create NGOs, how you create committees with representatives from those communities. Obviously these there are disputes. Not everyone agrees. Uh, some people have vested interest in telling this story and not that story. How do you solve those power struggles? Well, <clears throat> well uh, when we've gone, in this context in, in Oaxaca, when we've gone to the village meetings uh, and talked about what people are interested in, in uh, developing, uh, we have a series of techniques where we do a sort of brainstorming thing and we have more or less groups that work and see how the different ideas coincide. And where ideas coincide the most is where uh, the 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 consensus is, is discovered. And uh, to be perfectly frank, uh, there hasn't been that much conflict in, in those scenarios because a lot of people uh, have a certain idea of what they want out of a museum. Sometimes it's because there's been a previous event that mm. people feel that something is threatened, a yeah. uh, collection is threatened, or... Uh, they're very interested in not losing something, as, as you described, either mm. a practice or, or something of, the, of their physical heritage. Uh, or people sort of have an idea that they're famous for, as I say, their wedding or their healing practices. Of course, we could say that, uh, I'm sure you know, many people will uh, be able to criticize this as saying that people tend to project what's positive about their community and mm. they tend not to talk about a lot of mm. the conflicts mm. that they have. And this this could be true, <clears throat> but um, we consider that's that's part of the process. Yeah. People claiming what they feel they need to identify <laughs> with, what has to do with their self-esteem, and that in the process, you know, this is uh, ways that people will be able to talk about their collective identity in greater depth yeah. as time goes on. One final question. Um, let's say if I'm a museum director here in Holland, I would say, great, great idea. Perfect. I want to. I want to get all those people together. They. They. I'll share uh, the decision-making process. But we need professionals like me, because you might be a nice farmer or or housewife or tailor or whatever. But if your sons and daughters choose to leave the village, and you die, then you need people like me to keep this tradition alive. So. What do you, how do you, how do you, I mean, farmers and housewives are not trained to run a museum. How do you get this, mm. you know, how do you get them to, 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 to take part on a, on a, uh, what's the name, a sustainable way? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I think uh, 
for example, this the just to give you an example, the first museum that was opened in '86, so it's been open for 24 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been run by community representatives that change every year, so uh, quite a few people have been mm -hmm. through that mm -hmm. process, and uh, we give them guidance to know when they need to ask for expert advice yeah. in certain areas. So, of course, they do not know how to uh, you know, put together an archaeological artifact, but they know how to recognize when it's important to ask for yeah. someone to come in and, and help mm -hmm. them with this. Mm -hmm. So, And that really doesn't require mm -hmm. an expert. Mm -hmm. It requires you know, a certain sense of, um, of taking care of things. And I think uh, that, uh, quite frankly, we tend to overvalue sometimes why everything needs an expert. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> that in many of these institutions, in these community institutions, uh, it's more important to have a group of people who are, whose uh, interest is mobilized, who are really paying attention to what they're doing, who are interested in keeping that together as part of uh, their heritage of their village. They probably take better care of that than someone who is on a you know poor salary and sure. maybe just not yeah. suspending the time. Yeah. So I think that yeah. it has more value yeah. in many ways. 